Let's open our Bibles to 1 Thessalonians, please, chapter one, uh, 2. And if you need a Bible, the ushers, of course, are coming uh, right along the aisles there. And I want to welcome our internet uh, congregation. And we're going through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And we're here in 1 Thessalonians on Wednesday night. So let's stand together, please. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, I'll read uh, most of it, and then we'll just see how far we get tonight. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, but even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from deceit or uncleanness, nor was it in guile. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness, God is witness, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children, so affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil, for laboring night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, we preached to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly, and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe, as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father does his own children, that you would have a walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Father, thank you for calling us into your kingdom. Thank you for calling us to your glory and what a glorious future it is. There's nothing greater, there is no one greater than you. There is no venue, if you will, beyond this life greater than where you are. And that is where we are going to be one day. You have guaranteed our safe arrival in heaven. And while we are here, Lord, we need help from you. We need your power. We thank you for the power of the word of God, the power of your Holy Spirit. And we pray that he, the Holy Spirit, would empower us in a fresh way this evening. We open our hearts to you and we ask, Lord, that you might speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Paul had really introduced himself as Paul the Evangelist in the first chapter of this letter in speaking about going to Thessalonica and preaching the gospel. And here in chapter 2, he really speaks about himself as Paul the pastor because the presentation of the gospel is one thing for people to hear the message of Christ, to believe it, to receive it, but then people need to grow. They need to be shepherded and pastored and nurtured in their faith, and Paul did that and was doing this in this letter. And so he speaks in chapter 2 about his conduct among them, and the first thing that he says in the first four verses he speaks about his uprightness, the way that he conducted himself. 
And so he begins there in verse 1 by saying, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. If you go back over to chapter 1, verse 5, he says, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. So in saying to them in verse 1 of chapter 2, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. He was saying that our visit to you was not a failure. And they would have, as this letter was being read, they would have said, absolutely it wasn't a failure. You came here along with Silas and along with Timothy, and you preached the gospel to us. We believed the gospel, and we were saved. So you're absolutely correct. Your coming to us wasn't in vain. It wasn't a failure. And so... Now, that's the first thing that he's reminding them. You yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not a failure. And, and in a sense, any normal, healthy church ought to be able to say that, that, you know, the ministry of our church is not a failure. Well, there's an effect from God through the Word, the Holy Spirit, in the lives of the members of the congregation. That ought to be uh, clear. There should be fruit taking place, and there, there is, of course, here. But then he lets us in a little bit on what had happened to him in verse 2, prior to coming to Thessalonica. He says in verse 2, but even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. Now, if you'll hold your finger there, please, and go with me back to the book of Acts, chapter 14, for just a minute. Paul is referencing what had occurred when he was in the city of Philippi. And in Acts, chapter 14, verse 5, Well, we'll just start in, in verse 1 of Acts 14. Now, it happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews and so spoke that a great multitude, both of the Jews and of the Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Therefore, they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews and part with the apostles. And then in verse 5, and when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to abuse them and stone them, they became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia to the surrounding areas. And then if you go to chapter 16, please, just a couple of chapters over to the right, chapter 16, beginning in verse 19, you see what he's referencing about when he was in Philippi. Let's start in verse 16 of chapter 16. It says, Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days, but Paul, greatly annoyed or distressed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour, but when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities, and they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us being Romans to receive or observe. 
Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. And so when you go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and you read in verse 2 where he says, but even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, can you imagine being beaten with rods, dragged out into the marketplace, being beaten? I mean, let's back up a little bit. They were preaching the gospel, and this demon-possessed woman who was making money for these people as a fortune teller, Paul cast the demon out of this woman, and now they lost their source of income. So in retaliation against Paul and in, and in their hatred for Paul, they stirred up the city and wound up getting him thrown into jail. So here they did a good thing, cast a demon out, but wound up having all of this persecution come against them. They wound up being beaten, and they wound up being put in jail. And so when he says, but even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, and they had learned about this when Paul arrived in Thessalonica. He, you know, certainly they would have had the marks all over them because they went to Philippi following this event, uh, went to Thessalonica following this event. They would have had the marks all over them. Hey, what happened to you? Why is your nose halfway over on the other side of your face? And your eyes are puffy, your lips are all, you know, uh, swollen and so on. So they knew what had happened. He said, but even after all of this trouble that came upon us, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. Now, when you get in trouble for doing the right thing, and if you do the right thing, you will get in trouble. The Bible says, all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you live for God, like Paul was, you are going to suffer for it. And one of the things that happens when you suffer is you begin to consider options. I might change my profession. I don't know if I like all this suffering. Suffering hurts a lot. This was physical suffering, not just mental suffering. That can be just as bad. But instead of giving up and saying, you know, we didn't sign up for being beaten. We didn't sign up for all this suffering. They just kept right on going. And he says, we were bold in our God. He doesn't mean we were... Um, irreverent or, or imposing or uh, impolite or anything like that. He just means that in the midst of their, being, of their suffering, that the Lord gave them a boldness and a strength to keep on going, even though they had all this trouble against them. And that's a tremendous example for you and I, because we also suffer. We also have problems that come against our lives, and, and we're just people, just like Paul, and we want to just give up and give in and, and go away and maybe not do what it is that God has called us to do. And if you do what God has called you to do, as I mentioned a few moments ago, you know, don't you, that there is an adversary who is aware of what you are doing. If you are doing what God has called you to do, you are going to have an impact against his kingdom. The devil is a liar, a murderer, and a thief. And he is filled with pride. And he hates it when Christians 
are working to bring the key that opens the door to get people out of his kingdom free from that dominion of darkness so they can come into the kingdom of God. He absolutely hates that because he's jealous. So when he sees you, he and all of his demons, when they see you consecrating your life to God, dedicating your life to God, seeking to do the work of God, you can bet your bottom dollar, wherever that came from, you can bet your bottom dollar that he's going to come and punch you right square in the face and try to stop you. That's what happens. That's what happened to Paul. He got in a lot of trouble for doing what God called him to do. I'm certain at your place of employment, if everybody's cheating and you don't want to cheat, you're going to be the cause of their troubles. If everybody's lying and they want you to lie, and you say, well, I, I can't do that, you're going to get in a lot of trouble for that from your fellow workers. It could even be your boss who wants you to lie. Or whatever the case may be. But as you seek to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, what a wonderful you know, effort that is. You are going to suffer, but the other side of it is God is there to also help you in the midst of your suffering. And by the way, nobody else can really help you. You can't help yourself. You and I need God's power and God's help to help us when we're going through tough times where we're being oppressed by the enemy. And one of the biggest things that the devil does through people who do not believe in God is they try to pretend that there is no devil and they make fun of Christians who say that there is a devil. The Bible says there is. Jesus says there is. But one of the things that God will do is he'll help you. He'll give you the humility. He'll give you the power. He'll give you the boldness. He'll give you the fearlessness. He'll give you the umption, the gumption, the want to, the ability to do it, just like Paul. So look at verse 2. But even after we had suffered before, and they had suffered greatly, he is saying to them, you know how badly we had been treated at Philippi. Just before we came to you, you know what happened to us. You know how much we suffered there. Yet our God gave us the courage to declare his good news to you boldly in spite of great opposition. And the opposition that he's perhaps referring to is explained a little bit in verse 3. Because one of the things that happens to people who are committed to serving Christ is they become the objects of accusation and slander and false accusation. And so in verse 3 and verse 4, Paul is ex defending himself against what apparently were three particular lies that were being told about him to these Thess Thessalonians. He said, first of all, for our exhortation or our teaching to you did not come from deceit. Their preaching wasn't with any deceit. They weren't making up this message is the idea. His teaching wasn't something that... Uh, was in error. They were, they were going around saying, Paul is wrong. What Paul is teaching you is in error. And you say, well, what was the error that they were saying? Well, they were saying things along this line that, yes, you need Jesus, but you also need to do certain things in order to be saved. These were the Judaizers. They were trying to 
add works to salvation. Salvation is gained not by works, but by the grace of God through faith. We, we believe in Christ, we receive Christ, and we're saved. We don't work for our salvation. We receive it as a gift. There's nothing you can do to make yourself saved except receive Christ. He is salvation. What these people were saying, and it happens even today, well, that yes, that's all good, but you also need to do these other things. And in this case, they were trying to add parts of the Mosaic law into the gospel that was being preached. So he is, he's rebuking or rebutting and refuting this accusation against him that what he was teaching was in error. He said, our exhortation didn't come from deceit. There wasn't any error in what we were saying to you. We preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to you. Nor was it from uncleanness. There was apparently an accusation that Christianity encouraged sexual immorality. And that somehow Paul was encouraging people to be sexually immoral. He said, that, that didn't come from us. In fact, he deals with sexual immorality in chapter 4. If you look over there very quickly in verse 1. He says, finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and please to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. So there was apparently this accusation that he was preaching and encouraging or that Christianity somehow encourage sexual immorality. And he's saying, our message wasn't like that. And of course, the society around him was like our society today, uh, sexualized, obsessed with sex. It's the biggest industry, the pornography industry, is the biggest money-making industry. You put all the, the sports teams together, basketball, football, baseball, you put them all together, there's more money made from pornography than all of that. It's huge. Millions and millions and millions of websites and hits and people spending hours involved in sexual immorality. And so he said, we weren't, first of all, we weren't wrong in what we taught you. We taught you the gospel. And secondly, we were not promoting sexual immorality. And then lastly, nor was it in guile. That is, he was being accused of being underhanded in his ministry, of being in it for the money. And these are common accusations that are made today by haters of the gospel. They hate the message of the gospel and they'll do everything they can to tell you that, it does, that the Bible is not true. And they'll make a mockery of uh, sexual purity. And they'll encourage all kinds of deviant sexual behavior and say, it's okay. And they will then accuse especially ministers of taking money or being in it for the money. That isn't to say that there aren't ministers who are doing that, but it's one of the common accusations. And Paul was saying, look, you know that when we came to you, there wasn't a failure there. You got saved. And you know that even after we suffered like we did in Philippi, God helped us to come to you and we preached to you. He gave us the boldness to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. I mean, imagine the conflict within himself and Silas and, and Timothy. What's going to happen to us when we get to Thessalonica? 
Are we going to get beat up again? I mean, listen, if somebody knocked your teeth out in Tulare and then they said, okay, go to Visalia and preach, you might say, well, <laughs> just a minute here. Could I go to Woodlake? You know, spend the night there. I mean, that's really what was happening. And, and there, was, there was conflict among the Thessalonians as we spoke about last week. These people lived pagan lives. And here came Paul and Silas and Timothy telling them, you're on your way to eternal judgment unless you repent of your sins. Christ came to save you from eternal death. And they believed him and they had to deal with family members who weren't saved. They had to deal with their neighbors who weren't saved. They had to deal with their fellow workers, their community, their social world that mocked them and made fun of them. They were going against the grain. And so anytime the gospel is being preached, there's conflict, there's spiritual conflict. I know when I first got saved and God was leading me from one location to the other, uh, a, a fellow picked me up and I was leaving Waxhaw, North Carolina to go to Charlotte and I hitchhiked. And the guy said to me, he said, hey, listen, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm, I'm trying to follow God. And I was explaining to him what I was doing. He said, oh, you don't want to do all that. He said, listen, I'm going to the park and we're going to get some heroin and shoot it up. Why don't you come with me? And I'm looking at him and in my mind, I'm going like this to him. You know, even though I never had done that, I mean, in my mind, I'm thinking, you're the devil. You're, you're trying to... You're inviting me to go do something that I'm trying to get away from. How in the world, out of all the people who could pick me up, would there be one guy who is offering to give me drugs? And, and even uh, as a brand new Christian, I couldn't have articulated it theologically or scripturally or with the knowledge of what's in the Bible, but I knew I do not want this. This is coming from the dark side of life. I was just speaking with a young man this evening and warning him, listen, you, you draw a line with your friends. Don't let your, your unsaved friends try to drag you across the line of morality into immorality. You say no to them. And you use their invitation as an opportunity to tell them the reason I don't want to do that is because Christ has saved me. Use it as an evangelistic outreach. So he's defending himself and it's very normal for people in ministry to be accused and accused falsely, I might add. For our exhortation didn't come from deceit, it wasn't from error, nor or uncleanness. We weren't trying to say something like that to you, nor did it come from guile. We weren't there with any deceit or impure motives or trickery. We weren't trying to do something underhanded. Here's what we were doing, verse 4. But as we have been approved by God or we're speaking as messengers approved by God, as we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. You know, Pastor Abel talked about the word steward, and he gave us a little teaching there about our life as a stewardship. Do you know, do you know that every one of us has been called by God, not only all of us who are saved, we're also called by God to serve him. And he's given us all a stewardship, a responsibility. And one day, all of us will give an account to God. What did you do with the responsibilities and the opportunities I gave you? How did you live your life? And we will each individually give an account of how did we live our lives? What did we do? And this is one of the great blessings of the fact that one day we're going to not only be in heaven, but the potential for reward. You may, you may be just an average Joe down here, 
you may not have a lot of money and you may be worried about how you're going to pay next month's rent or what are you going to do at retirement. You may struggle with all of those things, but I'll tell you this, if you're serving the Lord, you are storing up treasures in heaven. And when you get to heaven, Christ is going to reward you for what you've done down here for him. And whether you are a big shot, a medium shot, a small shot in the eyes of people or people don't know you or don't care about you, none of that matters. All that really matters is, am I doing what God has called me to do? And you know, every time I've tried to get out of doing what God has called me to do, he won't let me do it. I've tried a few times when I've been discouraged. And I can, I, listen, I can concoct a getaway scheme in minutes. I've concocted a few of them. And then all of a sudden, God just says, well, that's not what I'm calling you to do. And who do you think you are? In fact, one time he just said to me, he said, you know, this is back when the Oklahoma bombing of the Murrah building took place. He said to me, he said, I was so discouraged at that time. I was in Arizona. And, and he said to me, he said, you are no longer your own. I have purchased you. You belong to me. It is not up to you to make the decisions about what you are going to do. That is my prerogative. And I said, oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot that for a moment. But that's the truth. And so, Paul is saying here in verse 4, what a wonderful thing. We've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. The only message that can save a person's life. God has entrusted the church with the gospel and he said, even so we speak. In other words, he was saying, I'm a faithful minister of the word of God. God gave me the gospel, and I speak the gospel, and I preach the gospel. And how I do it is at the end of verse 4, he says, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. He says, our purpose is not to please people, but to please God. You know, if you start trying to please people, you are going down a nowhere road. You will be spinning more plates than you could ever imagine. Got to please this guy. Got to please that person. This per I had a pastor once tell me who resigned from his ministry here. There were 800 people in his church, and he said, I just couldn't spin 800 plates any longer. He was brokenhearted trying to please all of these people. I'm not suggesting pastors shouldn't be sensitive to and caring, obviously, but the motive in all of our lives is to please God and not people. And he says, God tests our hearts. He says, God is examining the motives of our hearts. Now, you know, that examination, God is, he says, God tests our hearts. He examines the motives of our hearts. And so when we have a trial that comes our way, it really stops us dead in our tracks. It makes us take stock of what am I doing and why am I doing it and who am I doing it for? That's one of the benefits of a trial. And God wants to, through those trials, direct us as needed and get us back on track if that's what's needed. And thank God that he examines our hearts. Thank God that he's, he's faithfully tending his, his family of children because we're like little kids running all around the place and he needs to, hey, oh, oh, stay over here. Don't run out in the road and get yourself in trouble. And this is where fellowship is so important because one man's countenance sharpens another man's. This is why being in the word of God is so important for me, for you, for everybody. You know, I don't get to go to church at all. I, I am at church functioning and speaking. I rarely get to do what you do, which is to sleep during a service like this. 
I get to go to a pastor's conference once in a while, and, and I'm always amazed when I sit at the pastor's conference. God is reminding me of things, and he's uh, speaking to me and saying, hey, you know, let's get over here. Watch out. Don't do that. And, or I'm seeing things at a conference that, you know, I, no, no, that's not what I want. That's not what God says in his word. So I enjoy those opportunities to, to be spoken to from the word of God in the fellowship. We need that. He continues to describe how industrious he was. He's spoken of his uprightness, but now he speaks of how industrious he was in verses 5 through 9. He says, For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness. God is witness. So, Never once did we try to win you with flattery. That wasn't part of how he ministered. The word there is actually cajolery. It it speaks of an attempt to persuade by use of insincere speech kind of leaning to your own understanding to try to get people to believe the gospel. There's there's much of that happening today in Christianity. The abandonment of the simple word of God and the embracing of so-called methodologies that will appeal to people's carnal appetites to try to get them into churches and And it gets them into churches all right, but it does nothing to change their lives or to feed them. We really don't need methodologies. What we really need is to follow the examples in the Bible. We need to depend on the Holy Spirit. We need to love one another. We need to teach the Word of God. We need to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to keep our eyes on Him, and He's coming back. That's all that we need to do. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. And so he said, we didn't use flattering words. We weren't kissing up to people and trying to uh, speak to them in some way to get them to do what we think they should do. We weren't flattering people, as you know. And they would have thought, well, yeah, that's right. He, He told us we were all sinners and on our way to hell unless we repented. That's not very much flattery, is it? I didn't hear anything from you there, but it was a rhetorical question. Nor a cloak for covetousness. We weren't pretending to be your friends just to get your money. And that was another accusation. You know, Paul is really just, he came to you to get money from you. And he says, God is witness. One of the things that I find very comforting in this life, when I deal with false accusations, is that one day I'm going to appear before Jesus Christ along with everybody else, and the truth will be known. In fact, when any, whenever anyone I know currently dies and goes to heaven, I go, well, they just got the whole story right now as soon as they arrived. Because we will know even as we are known. When my pastor went to heaven, I thought, man, he's probably thinking, oh, no, I didn't even know it was worse than you said it was. I take great comfort in that. God is witness. That also ought to be a place of warning for us. God is witness. He knows what we do when nobody is around. He goes on to describe his, the way that he pastored, his industrious 
manner among them there in verse uh, 6. He says, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. As for human praise, he's saying, we never sought it from you or anybody else. We we weren't there asking you to to praise us. We weren't weren't motivated by, you know, I, I want people to know who I am and have that kind of praise. He said, we didn't seek that from you guys or from anybody else. And you know, Paul is a great example of humility because God told us in the Old Testament, I will not share my glory with anybody. And so when people in ministry start doing what they do to be seen and known by other people and kind of try to push God out of the way, God will remove his hand from those people. He doesn't share his glory with anybody. In fact, The kind of person that God will use is the kind of person who is committed that God gets the credit for the work. And we all have to deal with our pride. All of us do. Like we have to deal with any other sinful propensity. And when we recognize it, we need to just say no to it. Say, I'm not going to let that prideful way come into my life. I don't want to live that way. So Paul is saying, we weren't seeking glory from you, either from you or from others, when he says, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. As apostles of Christ, we certainly had a right to make demands of you. He really, he's just saying to them, look, we could have rolled into Thessalonica and said, listen, guys, I am the Apostle Paul, so straighten up, shape up, do this, do that. And I'm telling you to do it. I mean, he could have laid out his authority like that, but he said, we didn't make demands of you. And, and so th- as this letter is being read, and these people who are listening to all these lies about these accusations against Paul, they're listening to, they're thinking, well, you know, that's, that's right, when he was here, that's... What he's saying, that is exactly how he behaved himself. So they they didn't make demands upon people. And I think that's a wonderful uh, principle for you and I in ministry to always refrain if we think we're starting to make demands upon people, that we just take a step back. And we can make requests of people We can encourage people, but it's not our place to make demands upon people. We're not lords over anybody's faith. We're helpers of their joy. So here, if anybody could make some demands, it would have been Paul, but he chose not to. And then on a more positive note, from verse 7 through 9, he speaks in in a positive sense. He says, but... We were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So he's using this analogy. He's saying, look, number one, we were gentle among you. Just like a nursing mother who would cherish her own, a mother who's nursing a little child. If you've ever, well, I'm sure you have seen a mother nursing I mean, it's a beautiful thing to see the, the care and the love and the comfort and the, the wanting to help that little child and the gentleness involved in a, a nursing mother. So Paul said, this is how we were when we came there. We were gentle. Gentleness is part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And in a sense, he's saying, we were almost like children among you. We were just gentle. We were just like, I mean, you see the little kids that are going to be running around here now. They can get out of line and all that, but they're generally pretty gentle, except when they run over you. Um,
He says, or we were like a mother feeding and caring for her own children. And this is part of his industry and his ministry. And this is what our ministry ought to be like. This is such a a wonderful example for us. In verse 8, so affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become dear to us. We loved you so much, he's saying, that we shared with you not only God's good news, but our own lives as well. He had an affection for them, willing to give them the gospel and whatever else might be needed. And he says, because you had become dear to us the great love that he had for these people. You remember, he says in verse 9, for you remember, brethren, our labor and toil, for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, we preach to you the gospel of God. Don't you remember, he's saying, dear brothers and sisters, how hard we worked among you when we were there? Night and day we toil to earn a living so that we wouldn't be a burden to any of you. So Paul worked a full-time job, if you will, or he worked a job enough hours to provide for his own needs. You know, when my wife and I came here, uh, there was no church, there was no salary, there was no life insurance, there was nothing. I mean, most people, when they go and they begin a job somewhere, they don't go to the front office and say, okay, so I'm your newest employee. Yes, you're, and the pay is what? It's zero? That you're at, there's no pay, right, no pay. Uh, how about benefits? No, no benefits either. But you're expected to work here for 40, I mean, it doesn't work that way, right? And um, when we came here, we had nothing and didn't really ask for anything. My wife worked as a waitress while I just slouched around all day at the house. No, I studied my brains out because when, I, when we came here, the mission that the Lord gave us was to find a small group of people and study the Bible with them verse by verse, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and grow in Christ with them. Now, I had been pastoring a church and had been teaching the Bible. I'd give anything for those cassettes. I could sell them on Amazon, I bet, for thousands, really. I mean, I would love to hear them. But when I came here, I really didn't know much about anything from the Bible. So I would spend days preparing to teach a message. And I'd only be able to study about five, six, seven, eight verses. And I had commentaries, and I was listening to tapes and trying to understand what does the Bible say. And and in one of the first studies that we had, the it was in Colossians, which is I don't know why I picked that book to start a study. That's a tough book to teach. And the, and I and I managed to teach through about five, six, seven, eight verses. And I said, well, I think that'll we'll kind of stop there for tonight. And the people said, oh no. Pastor Bob, keep going, please. And I knew in my mind, oh no, I don't know what these next verses have to say. And so I just said, no, no, I just think we should probably just wrap it up here for the night, you know. I was scared to death. That was just last week. No. (laughs) And when we started in the ministry and In Oregon, uh, I made no money in the ministry there. And if we made no money here, if I had to get a job to support my family, I would do that and continue serving the Lord here. And this is what Paul, he said, we didn't want to be a burden to you. 
And what Paul did, he was a tent maker or a sail repairer. We're not quite sure exactly what it was or perhaps both. I, I really think his tent making job, as it were, was that he repaired sails for ships. And so he would go and do his work and then go and minister. So we'll just go with these next couple of verses here. Verse 10. He talks now about his blameless behavior. He had spoken to us about the fact that he was upright. He spoke about his industriousness of how he worked. But now he's talking about his blameless behavior starting in verse 10. And he says, you are witnesses. And again, he's being accused of things. He says, you are witnesses and God also. It's about the third time he said this how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. Boy, that's quite a statement, isn't it? You yourselves are our witnesses, he's saying, and so is God. We were devout, we were honest, and faultless toward you all as believers. So Paul his behavior was uh, to be admired. How devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. And then in verse 11, as you know how we exhorted. So he keeps appealing to what they know. And you know, one of the things that I have found to be true about people who lie and slander and backbite and gossip about other people, and my wife and I have adopted this policy and found it to be proper, you know, people come to me all of the time and talk to me about this pastor or that pastor and first of all, I need to figure out if this is my business, because if it's not my business, then I'm being a busy body, or I'm meddling in something that is not my business. And, and if you meddle in something that's not your business, it's like picking up a dog by its ears. You're going to get bit. So if it's not my business, it's not my business. And secondly, if somebody accuses another pastor to me about something, I think we think to ourselves, well, what do we know about this pastor? How has this pastor treated us? How has, what do we know? Paul keeps saying, you know, you know, you know. And so we think, well, what do we know about this person? Because they're, these people are saying this about him. We don't, we've never seen this person do what these people are saying. So, we know this person to be different than what they're being accused of. I once had two really good friends, and they're still, you know, folks that I hang out with once in a while, and they just were slamming this other guy every time I'd see them. And I finally, I just said, why are you guys talking to me about that pastor? And they kind of said, I said, do you want me to do something? Oh, no. I said, well, then don't, please don't talk to me about him again. And they never have. And you know something? That guy that they were talking about is the exact opposite of what they were saying. And these two guys were kind of doing the very things they were accusing this guy of doing. A wise man once told me, if somebody's pointing a finger at you, they've got three of them pointing back at themselves. And so Paul keeps saying, you are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe as you know, 
how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his children. That's how we behaved ourselves. We were like a father. We were like a father there imploring you. Just like a father would speak to his children. How? In verse 12, that you would have a walk or a life worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So Paul did several things. He exhorted them, he comforted them, and he charged them to live the right way. And, and that's a good picture of the ministry, of exhortation or encouragement, and then comforting, and then charging people to do what they should do. You know, somebody once said the job of a minister is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. That didn't seem to register with you. That's something you ought to think about right there. I'll say it again, just because maybe you were taking a little time out. But somebody once said that the job of a minister is to comfort the afflicted, and there's a lot of people who are afflicted that need comforting, and to afflict the comfortable. Did you get it? Okay. You know, because we can become complacent in our relationships with God. And we need to be charged and encouraged to serve the Lord. And Paul was comparing his relationship with these people to that of a father with his children. There are three things here that you can practice in your own family. You, you parents or you grandparents, one is you can encourage children in the faith. And one way that you can do that is to live out your faith before your children. Live out your faith before your children. Doing this will show your children how one's faith affects the way a person lives. That they'll realize there's something to this. It, my parents try to live out what they believe. Secondly, fathers ought to comfort their children in the faith. Be available for your children when they face challenges to their faith. And, and you parents that have teenagers that are heading off to college and so on, man, oh man, they're going into the lion's den. And you need to be able to comfort them concerning their faith. They have questions about their faith. They're going to be challenged about their faith. And you fathers need to urge your children to grow in the faith. You need to be living the faith, comforting them in their faith, and encouraging them to grow in their faith. You set rules and boundaries that will help establish the moral foundation that children need to live a life that is well-pleasing to God. You set the rules and you set the boundaries. Don't let the world set it for them. And boy, it's hard. Dad, can I go to the dance tonight at school? <laughs> Whew. Maybe. I say that a lot to my kids. I'd say maybe, and they'd say, well, Dad, you always say maybe. I'd say, yeah, well, check with me later. Maybe is not a bad answer if you don't know what to say. What kind of dance is it? I mean, it's tough, isn't it? Well, all of the, everybody's going. So? Well, it's going to be weird if I, you know... I don't go, well, you're already weird, so, you know, I'll just help you be more weird. I mean, God sets the standards, not the world. The world will set the standards for your children unless you set them for them. And you grandparents, boy, what an influence you can have upon your kids. We can't be with our kids when they're little 24 hours a day, but we can help build conviction in their lives 
so that they'll make the right choices. And it's one of the most important investments fathers will ever make is to teach your kids and live your faith before them. And then they'll have to make their own choice. But at least you can go to bed at night knowing, you know what? I did the best I could. As opposed to saying, I didn't care. My dad, I hope he's in heaven. I think there's a chance he might be there. He died at 48 years of age. He died a long, slow death with cancer. I came home from Vietnam because he was dying. And he laid in that bed for months, about six months, from the time they operated on him till he died. And it's my hope he was raised as a Catholic, lived a pagan lifestyle, but it is my hope that he made peace with God there on his deathbed, as it were. I hope I see him in heaven. And sometimes I don't like to think about it too much, but... The older I've gotten, the more I think, you know what? I just, I think maybe he must have. He must have thought so deeply about the fact that he was going to die. And he had enough religious teaching. But one of the things that was funny about my dad was he would say this all the time. He'd say, you know, Robert, the family that prays together stays together. And I'm just a kid, you know. Oh, yeah, okay. You know what? We never prayed once as a family. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, I can't judge his heart, you know, and why he, but he, he would say it with like real gusto and conviction. You know, the family that prays together stays together. I, I don't know what he meant, what he was thinking. Maybe he thought somehow that he was praying. I don't know, but... We never prayed as a family, <laughs> and uh, we did stay together, though, until he perished and died. So I, I do hope that I get to see him in heaven. That's for sure. Well, next week, we'll, we'll try to finish this chapter. It's a glorious chapter, and uh, it's rich. And let's have the ushers come on up, please, and we'll... Now, you guys are just applauding because I kind of put you up to it last week. <laughs> Abel, maybe if you would be so kind. Uh, actually, I didn't know you were there. Would you please pray for the offering, if you don't mind? <laughs> 